Hi everyone, thanks for coming to this talk. Um, and today I'll talk about search problems in algebraic complexity theory, geometric complexity theory, and hardness of generators for invariant rings. And this is joint work with Ankit, Christian, Visu, Michael, and Avi. Okay, so the plan for the talk will be the following. I'll start with some motivation and then I'll, on why we should study invariant theory, and then I'll talk about uh, invariant theory, and then I'll move on to describe algebraic search problems, and I'll go on and describe the problem of generators, uh, which was proposed by Ketan in his GCT5 paper, and disprove one of his conjectures, and then we'll go on and state more conjectures uh, with regards to invariant theoretic problems and algebraic search problems, some of those posed by Ketan in his GCT5 paper, and then just give more open problems. Okay, so why should we study invariant theory? Well, because invariant theory in a high level deals with symmetry and symmetry is ubiquitous. For instance, symmetry appears when computing determinants, um, which you know, determinants are invariant under row and column operations. And also um, it appears in the graph isomorphism problem, uh, for instance, and the group that appears there is the symmetric group on the number of vertices. Um, so the action, like equivalence under this uh, action of the symmetric group is the graph isomorphism problem. Uh, and it also appears in quantum information theory uh, in the form of the quantum marginal problem. And this problem is the following. Given target marginals, uh, is there a corresponding pure state such that the marginals of each particle the probability distribution for each uh, particle is exactly the target marginal. Okay, this can be exemplified with the following picture. Uh, suppose that I have letters which project into the walls, in this case, for example, G, E, and B. And what we want to know is whether there exists a sculpture. Uh, the sculpture will be the pure state, such that you know, whenever you shine light through different directions, you get exactly these letters. So you can see that, you know, for G, E, and B, there is, exists such sculpture, but you can see that this is not a general phenomenon, right? There are triples of letters for which this does not happen. Another problem where symmetry happens, where invariant happens, is Hilbert Sturt's problem, which is the following. If I gave you two polyhedra in three dimensions of equal volumes, is it possible to cut one cut one of them and paste it together so that we can transform one of the polyhedra into the other polyhedra? And the answer is no. Uh, this was solved by Max Den via the Den invariant. Um, and just as a contrast, so if you have two polyhedra in the same area, it is possible to cut and paste uh, one polyhedra and transform it into the other. Okay, now, uh, once we have those problems, um, let's see how um, you know, these symmetries can lead us naturally to isomorphism or equivalent problems, right? So for instance, uh, fundamental math and complexity problems such as if I give you two matrices, are they similar under invertible transformations, right? The invertible transformations are the groups that are acting, so are the symmetries that are acting that can, take, that can make two matrices that don't seem to be the same, to actually be similar under this, this group operations. Um, another problem which is very familiar to all of us is the graph isomorphism problem and its generalizations into algebra isomorphism or word problems and so on. Um, another problem, uh, another important isomorphism equivalence problems which is very important in algebraic complexity theory and in complexity theory in general is the equivalence between two algebraic circuits which is the celebrated polynomial identity testing. And another problem, which turns out to be an isomorphism equivalence problem in the certain sense that exhibits this um, symmetry um, paradigm that we just saw in the previous slide, is our favorite problem in algebraic complexity theory, the most fundamental problem, which is VP versus VMP. And this is the approach initiated by Mumule and Sohoni in geometric complexity theory. Uh, but another problem, which is very familiar to us all, but many of us don't see it as an isomorphism or equivalence problem, which is very simple, is the perfect matching problem in bipartite graphs. 
okay? And this problem is essentially the same as, is a matrix equivalent to the zero matrix? And equivalent in here, whenever I say equivalent, I mean many different things for each of these bullets. So let me explain to you this last bullet, which is the simplest of them all, okay? But there are many more isomorphism equivalence problems where these symmetries are playing the role of the difficult part of on whether on telling whether two objects are actually equivalent. Okay, so now let's see the perfect matching as an equivalence testing problem. Suppose that I have a bipartite graph, and in this case here, we have actually a perfect matching, and here's the JCC matrix of this graph, and here's another graph G prime, and which does not have a matching, and you can verify, and here's the JCC matrix of this graph. Okay, so um, we say that a graph has no perfect matching, okay, if and only if this graph, so this adjacency matrix AG prime is equivalent to zero by a row and column scaling, okay, in the matrix scaling problem. So essentially, deciding whether a graph has a, a perfect matching or not is essentially to say whether the graph is equivalent to zero or not under the matrix scaling problem, okay? Now, I hope I have motivated you a little bit, and now I'll describe the basics of the objects that I'll be talking about for the rest of the talk. So the basics, so for invariant theory, invariant theory is concerned with the group G acting linearly on a vector space V, and I'll denote by this curly arrow, okay? G acts on V. So let me give you some examples. Suppose that I have the group, which I'll call the standard torus, the special torus group, Okay, and this is the set of all diagonal matrices. Okay, so if you see here, alpha one up to alpha n, this is one set of, so if you see here, alpha one up to alpha n is, um, this is on the left and on the right, this alpha one up to alpha n and beta one up to beta n. These are matrices with determinant one. Okay, and the action, is on the vector space is the space of all matrices with complex entries, okay, which I denote here by mat NC. And the matrix scaling problem, the group action will be what? I'll take a matrix A into a left multiply by the matrix alpha one up to alpha n, and I right multiply by beta one up to beta n. So you can think of the alpha one up to alpha n being the row scalings and beta one up to beta n being the column scalings, okay? And the determinant being equals to one, is equivalent to the product of alpha i product beta j equals to one, okay? Another problem uh, which is captured by invariant theory is whether two matrices are similar, right? And here, well, you could define either similar by um, left and right multiplication, but let's just define here for left multiplication. And here we have the special linear group, okay? So these are all the invertible matrices with determinant one acting on, again, the space of n by n complex matrices uh, by a left multiplication. So G here is a matrix with determinant one, and it acts on A simply by left multiplication. And another, another example of a group acting linearly on a vector space is the operator scaling problem, where we have here um, that I have my group now will be a product of two special linear groups of the same dimension acting on a tuple of matrices. Now here you see I have n matrices, which are n by n over the complex numbers, and my action will be the following. A tuple of two matrices G and H, which are the left and the right multiplication, they act on this tuple A1 up to AM from my vector space by simultaneous uh, left-right action, okay? So I take each AI to G AI H transpose, okay? Um, and for the rest of the talk, you could think of our, our groups will be continuous, okay? But more technically, you can say connected, reductive, and algebraic. Okay, now let's go to the basics. So given a point V in my vector space, we define its orbit as the image, as the set of all points which are of the form G acting on V for G in the group. So if I take V, I take all the elements of the group and I multiply like each element of the group by V, if I take this collection, this is my orbit, the orbit of V. And the closure of this orbit is the orbit with its limit points, okay? Also, uh, you can consider this as the zero set of all the polynomials that vanish on the orbit is the orbit closure, 
Okay, this is because there's a risky topology and the Euclidean topology uh, agree for, for, this, for this case. And so the null cone is the set of all vectors V in our vector space, such that zero is in the orbit closure of V. Okay, so these are the elements that you can think of which are equivalent to zero. Okay, this is the, the null cone. And the null cone problem is the following. Give an element of this vector space is zero in the orbit closure, or in the language that we were using before, is zero equivalent to V, okay? Like in the matrix scaling problem. Okay, so bipartite matching sits here is, a null, is an example of null cone problem. And then we have more general problems, which is if I give you two vectors, V and W and V, do the orbit closures intersect, okay? And in this problem here, graph isomorphism is an example of an orbit closure intersection. And a more general problem is the following. Given V and W, is the orbit of closure of V contained in the orbit closure of W? Okay, in other words, you can also say like, is V contained in the orbit closure of W? This is a generalization of the other problems. And here actually sits the VP versus VNP problem. This is the approach that Mumulay and Sohani started in 2001. Okay, so these are the three problems that we'll be concerned about. As you can see, they're uh, written in somewhat order of difficulty. Um, and the main message here that we want to convey is that understanding orbits and their closures is a central problem in invariant theory and also a central problem in complexity theory. Okay, and can polynomials help us on this quest? Okay, so now let's see which polynomials will help us. So there's a definition, here's the definition of invariant polynomial. It's a polynomial that doesn't change by the action of G, okay? So if I take a polynomial uh, and then I act on this polynomial by acting on its variables, so like the G action will act on the variables, okay? This polynomial will be invariant if P of X is equal to P of G acting on X for every G in my group, okay? So here are some examples of polynomials which are invariant. So if you remember our action uh, by left multiplication, okay, I take a matrix A, so sorry, this is a typo, this should be A. So if I take a matrix A to G times A, the determinant of G times A is equal to the determinant of G times the determinant of A. But remember, G is in the special linear group, so its determinant is one, and therefore this is equal to the determinant of A. Um, and now, we also have uh, another example is the matrix scaling problem. Uh, and let's see another invariant polynomial. So here we have the special torus group, right? So they're all the diagonal matrices with determinant one acting on the space of matrices. Now, if we take a matrix X, then notice that if you take any permutation sigma, okay? And a permutation corresponds to a matching in the bipartite graph, so if you take any permutation xi sigma i, after you act on xi sigma i, you get the following polynomial, which is product of xi sigma i, but I multiply xi sigma i by alpha i and beta sigma i. Now, if I group together alphas and betas, I get that this product here on the left is equal to the product of alpha i times product of beta i times product of xi sigma i. And remember, these two products here of alpha i, beta i, they're equal to one which means that this polynomial is an invariant, okay? So these polynomials exist, and we can see if they can help us in our quest. So if we go back to the null cone problem, this is the set of all vectors V, such that zero is in the orbit closure V, and the null cone problem is that given V is zero in the orbit closure. So Hilbert in 1893 and Mumford in 1965, they show that the null cone is the zero set of all homogeneous non-constant invariants, okay? Uh, and we'll call this the set of the ring generated by all of these polynomials. We'll call it the ring of invariants if you add the constants, of course. So this is a C algebra. And so it turns out that this null cone, as we saw before, captures many interesting problems in math, physics, and TCS. I mentioned the bipartite matching, but recent works, we also related them to brass and bleed inequalities and operator scaling and many more problems. So, okay, so here's an example of null cone problems. So again, if I have just the special linear group acting on matrices by left multiplication, 
my invariants here are going to be the determinant, is the only invariant, uh, or polynomials on the determinant, and of course the constants, but I'm only going to mention on constant invariants. And the null cone here is exactly the set of singular matrices. So deciding whether a matrix is singular is a null cone problem. In the matrix scaling problem that we just discussed, remember the invariants are exactly the matching monomials, which are the monomials that arise from this permutation sigma. And the null cone is all the adjacency matrices whose support has no perfect bipartite matching. Okay. And another example of an Alcon problem is the action of the special linear group by the left-right action that I described. The invariants here are a little bit more complicated, and the null cone is the non-commutative singular matrix. So this captures, for instance, uh, the rational identity testing in the non-commutative setting. Okay. So here, the observation that I want to convey is that different group actions capture many important problems. So these problems, even in their special cases, are very interesting. Now, here are basic questions that we can ask, right? So the orbit closure intersection problem. Given V and W, do the orbit closures intersect? Well, in 65, Mumford proved that the orbit closures do not intersect if and only if there exists an invariant polynomial P, such that P evaluates differently to different values in V and W. So these invariant polynomials, they can witness the orbit closure separation, okay? And this already gives us a possibility of, uh, of a randomized algorithm for this problem, which is simply take a linear, random linear combination of the generators of the invariant ring, okay? And this linear combination with high probability will witness that these two orbits do not intersect, okay? But the question is, can we find such a random invariant? Okay, so, but the upshot here is that these theorems of Hilbert and Mumford show us that invariants help us in understanding orbits, okay, and their closures. But now, what do we know about these invariants? Well, we know many things, uh, which I will not describe, but I'm happy to talk about this later. Uh, but having this motivation about evaluating a random invariant, uh, Mumule in 2012 had the remarkable idea of defining these notions of succinct generators, okay? And here is the notion that uh, Ketan defined, and he related that problem that we just saw in the previous slide to a PIT problem. So, so the idea that Ketan had was the following. So if I take my invariant ring, okay, we say that this invariant ring has C succinct generators. If there is a polynomial size circuit, F, which, which depends on the variables v, little v, which come from the vector space v, and y, which are auxiliary variables, okay? Uh, and this polynomial f v y is in C, is in C here, the curly C is the circuit class, such that we can write f v and y as a sum of f i v times g i y, so we can separate the, these polynomials. So there are polynomials g i only in variables y, and fi, which are only in the variables v, such that this set fi is a set of generators of the ring uh, of invariants, and the other set gi in the auxiliary variables y, they're linearly independent, okay? And why is this good? Well, so if c, if the ring of invariants for the group g acting in the vector space v has c succinct generators, then the null cone and the orbit closure intersection problems can both be solved by solving PIT for the circuit class C, okay? So to test, for example, if U, if a point U is in the null cone, all we need to do is to test if this polynomial F, instead of having V now, I substitute V by U, now I have a polynomial only on the Y variables, and I wanna test if this polynomial is identically zero, okay? And to test whether orbit closure intersection, or two orbit closures intersect, um, we just need to test if, again, the orbit closure of U and the orbit closure of W, to test if they uh, intersect, we need to test if F of U in Y, this is a polynomial in Y, minus F of W, Y, is equal to zero, okay? So this is essentially uh, motivating us 
to work on this polynomial identity testing with motivations from invariant theory and geometric complexity theory. So PIT could solve all of these other problems from seemingly very different areas from computer science. Okay, and Mumule conjecture that in the general setting, if I have a group G, which is connected algebraic reductive, so it should just think as continuous or nice, acting linearly on a vector space V, uh, he said, if I have a group G, in his case, he mentioned explicitly the SLN and a vector space V, some representation of this group G. Uh, his conjecture was the following. Every group action has a polynomial size succinct generators, okay? So here you can think of the class C as being VP. Or not VP, but uh, just poly size and no restriction of degrees, okay? Note on this conjecture is that the assumption that the group is connected uh, is needed because otherwise the permanent is defined by its symmetries, okay? And its symmetries are not connected. So we know that this conjecture would be wrong already if we just take the group of symmetries of the permanent. Okay, now let's talk quickly about uh, search problems uh, in complexity theory. And search problems, they're essentially related to the existence of efficient or succinct functions f with some desirable property p, okay? What are such examples of functions? For example, de-randomization, f is the set of Boolean maps g, which take a short seed, uh, 0, 1 to the s, and stretch it to a larger uh, set, which is 0, 1 to the l. So we're stretching 0, 1 to the s to uh, 0, 1 to the l. And the property that we want to have p is that this Boolean map g when I take in the uniform distribution over the strings over zero onto the S, is computationally indistinguishable from the uniform distribution U on the set of L, L variable, L tuples, right? And in proof complexity, uh, F, for instance, is the set of syntactically valid proofs in a certain proof system, and P is a proof or refutation of a tautology in a proof system. So we want to find short proofs, efficient, succinct proofs in proof complexity. And in extractors, for example, you can think of f as the set of efficient Boolean functions. And p is the property of these Boolean functions having large mean entropy source. They map to roughly uniform distributions. OK? And if they exist, we want to find these efficient succinct functions. Now, um, in the algebraic world, we have the algebraic search problems. Uh, and for example, these appear prominently in algebraic proof complexity where, for instance, suppose that I take polynomials g1 up to gr, do they have a common zero? Now, here the set f of succinct algebraic functions is tuples of polynomials, f1 up to fr, which witness that these polynomials do not have a common zero via hubert nurstellensatz which is, you know, if these polynomials do not have a common zero, then there exists f1 up to fr, such that g1 f1 plus g2 f2 and so on, they're equal to one. So this is a reputation in this proof system. And depending on the representation of these input polynomials, uh, you get different proof systems. So for example, we have the Nustelensatz proof system and an ideal proof system and many others. Okay. And in this talk, we want to talk about algebraic search problems, which are motivated from geometric complexity theory, which is this null cone problem and orbit closure intersection problem that I talked to you before. Okay. Now, we describe the succinct generators, um, and essentially the succinct generators are exactly algebraic search problems from GCT, right? Because to solve null cone or orbit closure intersection, okay, one avenue to solve them, one avenue is to find a C succinct generator for a class that we know how to do PIT for, okay? So these are algebraic search problems which arise from GCT. Now, let me state our results uh, on hardness of generators. And the main message uh, that I want to convey in this talk is that, unfortunately, Ketan's conjecture uh, was not true, that we cannot obtain succinct generators, assuming that NP is not in P slash poly, or VP not equal to VNP, which are standard complexity assumptions. And this happens even for very simple actions, OK? And the question is, is this the end of the program or just the beginning? Okay, and it turns out this is just the beginning of this program, okay? So in the general setting of our result, if you take a group G, which is connected algebraic and reductive, acting linearly on a space B, what we prove is that 
generators this false, for example, already for the tensor scaling action, which is the tensor generalization of the matrix scaling. Okay, assuming NP not contains P slash poly, and here's the group action. I have instead of having two matrices now, I have three matrices, three diagonal matrices determined one, acting on the space of tensors of three tensors, and the action is the simple, the natural action. So a tuple alpha one up to alpha n, beta one up to beta n, gamma one up to gamma n, act on a tensor T simply by multiplying each entry T i j k by alpha i beta j gamma k. Okay, so the idea here is that there is no poly size succinct generators for this action unless NP is containing P slash poly. Okay, uh, and just a, as a remark, this action is very simple because for this action above, the null cone problem is actually in P. Okay, so you can decide whether a tensor T is in the null cone of this action simply by linear programming. Okay, so generators here does not seem like the way to go. Can we do something else? Okay, and I'll answer this in a later slide. Uh, and now, if we just say, okay, sure, we did this, but this is not the group that Ketan asked. Ketan asked explicitly for the special linear group acting on some representation. Uh, is this true? And the answer is this is our theorem two that the generator's conjecture is actually false in this setting as well. If the group is the special linear group, assuming that the P is not equal to PNP, okay. And here the group action is the SL two KN, where K is a parameter greater or equal to two even, uh, N is any natural number, and V is the tensor. If I take C to the two KN and I tensor this two K times. Okay, and the action is the diagonal action that G acts on this larger tensor. Oops, sorry. G acts on this larger tensor by acting on each of the tensor pieces um, diagonally, okay, the same action. So, and the upshot here is the same as in the other theorem is that the invariance of minimal degree is VNP complete. Okay. So the technical message that we want to convey with this paper is that there are no succinct generators assuming NP is not NP slash poly or VP not equal to NP. Um, and, and the main reason why there are no succinct generators is because generating the invariance of minimum degree is hard. Okay, but it could be that these are the hard ones and then later for degree a little bit higher, the invariants are easier to write. Okay, now let me use the time that I have left to talk, uh, to tell you some more conjectures and open problems. Some of those were actually um, started also stated by Mumuli. Okay, so, okay. So if we look at the invariant theory, um, again, the null common problem given a point B is zero in the orbit closure of B. So is zero equivalent to B. So Hilbert and Mumford, as we saw, show that B is not in the null cone if and only if there exists a polynomial, an invariant polynomial, non-constant, such that P, when you evaluate to V, is different from zero, okay? So we don't need all the generators um, of the ring of invariants to decide this. A subset of invariants is enough. And the subset has a special name in invariant theory, which is called the null cone definers, okay? And similarly, for the orbit closure intersection, we saw the Mumford's theorem that the orbit closures do not intersect if and only if there is an invariant polynomial such that the polynomial witness that the orbit closures do not intersect by evaluating to different values on P and on V and W. But again, we do not need all the generators to decide this. And even Mumford already uh, stated this. A separating set is enough, okay? Uh, and a separating set is a smaller set than the set of all generators. Um, it, these are facts known uh, to invariant theorists. And recently, it's even shown that degree bounds for separating sets uh, are strictly smaller than degree bounds for generating sets. So you need pol invariant polynomials of much lower degree to, to get a separating set without even generating the set of invariants. Okay, so these sets are different than all the generators. Um, so the conjectures here is the following. Before I state all the conjectures, is the null cone problem, as you saw, is weaker than the orbit closure intersection, which is weaker than the generator's problem. Now, the hope is, can we solve these first two problems, even though the generator's problem, which is conjectured by Mumbley, is actually unfeasible, it's hard. 
Um, and these are our open questions, right? Can we have, uh, can we rule out that we cannot have separating sets by giving lower bounds for encoding separating variant, separating variants? This is a much less understood problem. And this motivation, this work provides motivation, Mumule's work and this work provides a lot of motivation for studying separating variants. And this would solve the orbit closure intersection problem. And another open question is that, is the null cone problem in P for general group actions? It's not even known if the null cone is in NP intersection cone P for general group actions. Okay, and uh, related to the question of the null cone, can we get succinct encoding of the invariants defining the null cone? So again, this is a much smaller set than the set of separating invariants, which is a smaller set than the set generating invariants, okay? So could we get succinct encoding for invariants defining the null cone? And another problem, which is more of a research direction is, can we have a general complexity theory for invariant theoretic problems? So for instance, can we have reductions between group actions in the same way that we have reductions between problems in complexity theory? Can we have an action that is a complete action? That if we solve null cone for that action, we solve null cone for all other actions. And what other problems does computational invariant theory and geometric invariant theory capture uh, from computer science and other areas of mathematics? Okay, thank you very much for the talk. And I'll stop here.